So welcome to this um, radiology event. We are being joined by June. She's going to tell us about shoulders and um, elbows and what we're going to do um, is go through some cases together. So my name is Syra. I am the an F1 um, in the Oxford Deanery. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. So um, we've probably seen some of you before. So thank you so much. If we haven't seen you before, then welcome. Um, so over November, December and January, um, this radiology series aims to cover all the imaging modalities that doctors and healthcare professionals come across in the hospital. Last week, we saw Dr. Joe Kang, and um, they took us through the knee, ankle, and foot x-rays. And today, we'll be continuing the MSK section of the series with Dr. June Lau. Um, she's an SD2 in radiology, and she'll take us through a structured approach to the shoulder, elbow, and forearm plane films, which are some of the films that junior doctors, including me and you, hopefully, often find difficult to interpret. She'll go through a logical approach of how to interpret these plane films discuss some cases with us and so I am very very proud to introduce Dr. June Lau. That was um, very comprehensive. Thank you very much, Syra. So hi, everyone. My name is June. Um, and as Syra mentioned, I'm training as a radiology registrar in Manchester at the moment. And we're going to go through um, some trauma x-rays of the upper limb, namely the shoulder and the elbow. And at the end, we will cover a little bit of the forearm as well. So uh, in our session, I um, plan to cover a brief assessment structure. I know you all have your own ways of assessing. I'm just going to show you mine. And then once we're happy with that, we're going to go through the shoulder and the elbow and forearm. Now, in each of these sections, after we go through the assessment, we'll have a short quiz. So that's where I hope a lot of the interaction will come through. If you have any questions, feel free to just type it in the chat box. I will um, have lovely Syra just keep an eye. Uh, out on it for me and if there's anything pertinent she'll let me know um, and at the end if you've got any sort of burning questions we'll have time to answer those as well all right so we'll start off with our assessment structure um, like I said you'll find there are many many ways to look at trauma x-rays but I find that if I stick to one and stick to it always then you're going to see most uh, of your uh, pathology so I like to use ABC 2s and I use it for almost every single trauma plane film that I see. So A stands for alignment, very self-explanatory. I won't bore you with it. You just wanna make sure the joints are well aligned. So in here, you can see that there's a dislocation of the um, third metatarsophalangeal joint. Can you see my mouse, by the way, or should I? Um, Uh, let me try again. Um, yes, so you can see my mouse. We can see the mouse. <laughs> Sorry about that. Otherwise, it's going to be very tricky. There's a Thank laser you. pointer you can use as well if you want to. No, um, that's fine. I think I'm, I'm all right with this. Thank you. Um, right. Sorry. A, alignment. Happy. Moving on to B. So B stands for bones, and that is actually the bulk of your assessment, obviously. Um, and there are two ways you can look at bones. First is the cortical outline. So Normal cortex is crisp and sharp, and you just want to make sure that it's same the whole way through. Start at one of the end of the bone, go all the way around, make sure you close your loop, and then move on to the next bone. And if you do that, you and there is an abnormality, it often presents itself like a step. So here you can see there's a step in the cortex, and then when you notice a step, you can then obviously scrutinize it further, and you notice that there's a transverse fracture over here of the fourth metacarpal shaft. Now, um, this is a very common fracture after a punch injury, and it's also known as a boxer's fracture. Very common, especially if you're going to work in A&E and sort of um, people are coming in after they've punched someone or punched a wall. Uh, it's a common fracture to see in the fourth and fifth metacarpal. So cortical outline, very useful, even more crucial in children. We all know children's bones don't break the same because they're a bit bendier, they're a bit more elastic. And furthermore, um, children don't tend to have very much bone or, or sort of ossified bone. So when you're looking at children's cortex, really scrutinize the cortical outline and any sort of irregularity, just draw your attention to it. So in here, if I can convince you, there's a little bel uh, bulge here. And this bulge is known as a buccal fracture, also known um, 
as a torus fracture from time to time. Um, and this is a fracture in a child. There's a very, very, very subtle lucent line just go across, but the most, the more obvious abnormality is obviously in the cortex. Now I said there were two ways you can look at the bones. The second way is to assess the trabeculae or the texture. So bones have trabeculae and they tend to grow in lines of weight distribution. So in the, for example, in the femoral uh, neck and proximal femur, um, they there are lines in the direction that the weight is borne. I suppose. And you just want to make sure that there are no breaks in these lines that are masking any non-displaced and subtle fractures. Um, it can be quite difficult to interrogate this properly and thoroughly. So um, all I asked you to do here is just be aware of it and have a look at it. The next thing is texture. And when I say texture, I mean cortical texture. So um, when the bone is injured by anything, infection, inflammation, or a fracture, the sort of periosteal, periosteum, the cling film that surrounds um, the bones will react. And this is called periosteal reaction, very helpfully. Um, and it's basically when the cortex looks fuzzier, like in this picture over here. So here we have a case of a young woman who is a runner, uh, who went to a GP, said that she's got pain in her foot, did an x-ray, didn't really see anything kept running on it, went back to the GP a week, couple of weeks later, and then you see this over here. So this, some of you may already know, is a callus. And this fuzziness around the um, cortex is can sometimes be less subtle than this, and that, and that is a, a periosteal reaction. So this meant that there was a fracture before, a hairline or very subtle non-displaced fracture, stress fracture, um, that is or that can't be diagnosed on a plain film, um, um, but it's a fracture nonetheless, the bone reacts the same way and it develops a callus or a periosteal type reaction. Right, so you're happy with A and B, you can move on to C. C stands for cartilage and where there's cartilage, there's often a joint, so joint spaces as well. There are two things that you want to assess. One, the space. So is it narrowed or is it widened? Uh, and secondly, what's in the joint? Um, if it's narrowed, not very concerned, you know, it tends to be chronic, tends to be um, uh, degenerative in nature. Um, you want to be concerned when it's widened, especially in the context of trauma and sort of acute pain. So here you can see a narrowed joint space, um, which is very classic position for osteoarthritis in the big toe. Here, we can see a distal radial fracture and a widening of this joint space here. If I can convince you, this, these are all relatively uniform and very narrow, and all of a sudden you've got this gap. So this is important to note because not only have you got a fracture, but you've also got a rupture of ligaments. And, and that's why widened joint spaces in the context of trauma can be very important. So once you're happy with the, um, the width of the joint space, you need to think about what can be in the joint space. So classically be fluid, but obviously if there's a fleck of bone or an injury in the joint space, that's very important to note as well. So here we've got an example of the ankle. And um, if I can show you here, this looks very different to this, isn't it? So um, this is what's called an osteo, sorry, the arrows just showed up. <laughs> this is what's called an osteochondral fracture. So within the joint, the um, impact of the injury has taken off uh, the cartilage as well as the bone underneath osteochondral. Now this is very important. It can be very subtle, but very, very crucial to detect because it's an articular surface and it can change the management um, of the patient relatively drastically. It can move them straight on to more invasive type management versus a conservative route. So, yep, that's C. Oh, not yet. <laughs> There's also um, fluid that can appear in the joint space. Very classically, I'm sure you're all trained to look at effusions. So here's an example of a knee fusion just there. So A, B, C, then we've got our two S's. So the first S stands for soft tissue. And that's just a reminder for me to look at the soft tissue around the bones. Is there anything in it, any foreign bodies, any lucencies that can tell me that there's air or an open wound? Is it swollen? Is it symmetrical, et cetera, et cetera. So 
And here you can see that there's increased soft tissue swelling along the um, lateral malleolus. And in the absence of a fracture, that can be quite useful because it tells you that some other process is going on, ligamentous or tendinous damage. Um, another way soft tissue can be more important, can be crucial, is in children when the when the fractures are more subtle. If you've got significant soft tissue swelling, it makes it's almost like um, like a beacon, and it tells you to look harder, make sure you can't see a fracture before you send that kid home. Um, the second S stands for special review areas, um, and each X-ray has got a they've got different anatomy. So there are a couple of review areas that are become more pertinent. For example, in a C-spine X-ray, this little soft tissue region in front of the spine is one of the special review areas. And then there are special things we need to look out for in the shoulder and elbow X-rays, which I will go through with you in a moment. And that's it. That's A, B, C, and 2S. Does anyone have any questions before I move on? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> okay, so move on to the shoulder. So what I'll do in each section is we'll go through the anatomy, radiological anatomy of each one, and then we'll use our assessment structure to look at those films, and then we often will then move on to the quiz. Um, but just before we do that, I'll touch on some shoulder dislocations quite quickly, just because they are exciting and um, you can see them quite often in the ED department. OK, so when you ask for a shoulder uh, X-ray, you can get sometimes you get three, but more often than not, you get two out of these three films. You get an AP view. You always get an AP view and you could either get one of these views, which is known as an axial view and a Y view. So an axial view is interesting because you have to abduct the shoulder and then take the x-ray down like this. So the patient needs to have a decent range of movement, basically. And the Y view is taken with the scapula end on. So it, it's um, taken in this direction. So where you see your scapula like this. So briefly run through some of the anatomy. We've got your humeral head here, your glenoid. We've got your scapula. Then um, on the humeral head, you've got your greater and lesser tuberosity. You often can see the greater, lesser is much obviously smaller, but also it's more anterior. So it's not so obvious. Then you've got all the other knobbly bits, your acromion, clavicle, and your coracoid process that sort of points forwards in the shoulder. Now, these are your um, other two views. The active view used to confuse me a lot until I saw this graphic. So. These two views, the axial and Y views, are basically to determine um, the alignment of your glenohumeral joint. And if you imagine the humeral head is the golf ball on a tee, like this here, as long as your golf ball is sat nicely on your tee, that's a uh, enlocated joint. And if you imagine your acromion and coracoid like your pincer grip, you, you're um, usually in a good X-ray, your pincer grip should be holding the golf ball basically like like in this case um, and although in this view the most important joint is your glenohumeral joint you can see your acromioclavicular joint as well so make sure you have a good look at that so you're not missing anything this is your y view aptly named because it looks like a y so in this case you've got your rib cage so you know that this is anterior and then you've got your coracoid pointing forward your acromion kind of coming from the back to join your clavicle on this end. So you know that this is anterior and this is posterior and this is the blade of your scapula. So in this view, what you want to make sure is that your humeral head, whichever direction your humeral shaft is pointing in, it doesn't matter, but your humeral head is intersecting with this Y like this. And if that is the case, then it's in joint. Right. So we're happy with all our views. Now we can move on to trying to assess our shoulder joint. So we'll start with A. A is alignment. We've got two joints, so we want to make sure they're aligned. You've got your glenohumeral joint. You want to make sure it's that it's got that nice overlap, like the middle of the Venn diagram. Um, and then you've got your uh, acromioclavicular joint as well. The way you make sure it's in joint, first of all, if it looks in joint, then it probably is. But if you really want to be specific, then you could draw um, a line from the inferior border of the clavicle to the inferior border of the acromion. 
And if it forms a, a relatively smooth line, then it's in joint. And again, these are the two views to check our joint alignment as well. Golf ball on your T and your humeral head is in the middle of your Y. Yep. So once you're happy, you can move on to B. Self-explanatory, make sure you look at all the bones. You've got your humerus, you've got your glenoid, your clavicle, all your knob knobbly bits, your coracoid, or chromium. But don't forget your scapula. So people often ignore it because it looks like it's behind something else, but you can actually see the entirety of the scapula on a, on a good shoulder view. So make sure you just look at it, make sure they're not gross abnormalities, it's not fractured and things like that. Once you're done, you can then move on to C, joint spaces. So there's two joints and they're going to be two joint spaces. Um, the acromioclavicular joint is in the same alignment. So you just want to make sure this is not too wide. There are very specific measurements, but no one uses them because every every one is different. As long as it doesn't look too wide, not you're, con you're not um, concerned. Now in the glenohumeral joint, the joint space you need to look at is actually here. So it's underneath the acromion, aptly named the subacromial space. Because, because of the overlap of the actual glenohumeral joint, you can't really tell joint distension based on this alignment. You, you want to be looking at this alignment. So if there's joint distension, then this space will increase. And sometimes you can even see the humeral head being pushed down uh, as a result of that. And then we can move on to our two S's, so soft tissue, not just this soft tissue outside the bone, but remember you've got soft tissue here as well between your arm and your rib cage. And here is often where you'd see the first signs of surgical emphysema in the cases um, of further injury. Um, and on the shoulder, it's quite easy. You've only got one special review area, which is to make sure you look at all of the x-ray. Um, and by that, I mean, make sure you look at this bit of the x-ray as well. So your chest. It's almost half of the x-ray, but oftentimes we, forget, uh, oftentimes we forget to look at it. Um, so make sure that in the bits of lung that you can see, you can't see any gross uh, lesions. Then the ribs that you can see, make sure they're not displaced. And a very common thing um, to miss is a pneumothorax. So someone's got, they've fallen on their shoulder um, and you think they're um, tachypneic because of the pain, but really they could be having a pneumothorax. And the only image you've got is a shoulder x-ray. So it's worth looking out for. Right, so that's how you look at a shoulder. Before I move on to the quiz, I said I was going to talk about shoulder dislocation. So really quickly, get a bit of interaction from the crowd. I want you to tell me which you think is more common, an anterior dislocation or a posterior dislocation. And if so, can you tell on an AP film? Just waiting for a couple more people to answer. But looks like you guys have got the gist. Yep, that's right. So anterior is more common and a bit of a trick question, but yes, you can tell <laughs> on an AP film. Um, so anterior is more common because there's less muscle anteriorly um, and if you think if you just feel your own shoulder at the back you've got all your back muscles and then you've got your rotator cuff muscles and your um, deltoid and things like that they're preventing sort of backward um, movement basically so anterior is more common and I will show you how you can tell in an AP film so um, someone's mentioned light bulb sign which is great because that will tell us um, that can tell us which kind of direction um, a uh, shoulder dislocation is, but I'll get to that in a bit. So anterior shoulder dislocation. So you can see here, the glenohumeral joint is no longer uh, well aligned. You've not got that nice Venn diagram. In fact, it looks like the humeral head is kind of overlying the, the glenoid now. Um, 
And if you think about, I know it's a 2D image, but think about it. It's now kind of underneath the coracoid. And where's your coracoid? Your coracoid is anterior, isn't it? So for your shoulder to move forward, it has to move underneath the coracoid because it can't smash through it. So an anterior shoulder dislocation tends to be inferior medial. So it kind of moves down and in this way. Um, and you can see that on this Y view here, your humeral head is no longer in the middle of the Y and it's actually underneath the coracoid, which would prove it's an anterior dislocation. And this is a posterior dislocation. So very helpfully, it's showing what that sign that your colleague mentioned, the light bulb sign. So it looks like a light bulb as opposed to a walking stick. Um, however, I don't know if you've ever seen shoulder x-rays where the shoulder is internally rotated. It can also look like a light bulb. So it's not terribly specific or sensitive, shall we say. Um, but what's more important here is, oh, it looks it looks like it's actually still in joint, but it's not because look how posteriorly positioned it is. It's now under the acromion. It's under the acromion and a posterior dislocation doesn't have the, the, the impediment of the coracoid, so it tends to move back and upwards as well. And it's shown here. Again, you can see the humeral head is no longer in the middle of the Y and it's moved upwards and right underneath the acromion. So this is a posterior shoulder dislocation. Quickly summarize, on an AP view, for an anterior dislocation, it tends to move down and inwards, and posterior doesn't have the coracoid in its way, so it just moves up and out. On a Y or axial view, the anterior dislocation moves towards the coracoid, and your posterior moves backwards towards your acromion. And that's it. So once you've identified a dislocation, though, you would relocate it in a &E, you know, you give yourself a pattern back, you save the patient, and then you send them for a post-dislocation x-ray, obviously to check whether or not um, the shoulder is in joint. But what is also important is to determine if there are any uh, post-dislocation related fractures. So uh, you're definitely going to pick up a clavicle fracture, a humeral fracture, but what about fractures from the dislocation? Just really quickly, um, I will show you what these injuries are. Does anyone know what these are called? They're eponymous, which is not very helpful, but if you do, just drop it in the chat box. So these are called um, hill sacs and Bankart lesions. So you get hill sacs lesions. Um, well, both of, both of these you get from anterior dislocations. So hill sacs lesions happen when you've got your glenoid, you've got your humeral head. The force of the dislocation pushes the head forward, but you've still got all your muscles and you know, you've not torn all your ligaments intact. So what happens is that reverse force um, pushes the posterior superior bit of the glenoid again sorry the humeral head against the glenoid and then you get this notch type fracture over here um, and this is called a hill, hill sacs lesion and it's just important because if patients have further pain um, that uh, related to the um, dislocation it can be because they've got a fracture basically now the reason why i said Bankart and bone, I made a difference between Bankart and bony Bankart lesions is because a Bankart lesion is a tear in the anterior glenoid labrum, which you obviously can't see on a plain film. But if that force is so great that you not only tear the glenoid, but you also shatter the front bit of your uh, bony uh, glenoid, not just the labrum, then you get what's called a bony Bankart lesion. Now, these are more important to pick up straight away because it's an articular surface. You want to um, and you want to make sure that, that um, the orthopods or the patient is aware that this has happened so that management can be tailored towards this specific fracture. And that's it. So we've talked about shoulder dislocations, how to tell what our post-shoulder dislocation type injuries. And we've also gone through our um, assessment system for shoulders. A quick recap. 
So I'm going to show you how I look at a shoulder x-ray and then we can move on to the quiz and you guys can do all the assessments. So A, alignment, glenohumeral joint, nice Venn diagram impression, and your AC joint is nice, smooth line, so it's in joint as well. You're making sure that you've got your golf ball on your T and your humeral head is in the Y. Fine, and then you can sort of, don't discard them, but these are less important now. You can focus on your AP film. B, look at all the bones, and then make sure you look at your scapula. Trace it all the way. C, I'm looking at my joint spaces and my cartilage. So this joint space is fine, this joint space is fine. And then my 2S, my soft tissues, looking at the soft tissues outside, checking for any swellings, foreign bodies, any surgical emphysema over here, over here. And then my special review area, making sure I look at the rest of the film, so the chest as well. Looking at all my ribs. Mm -hmm. And then making sure this lung looks relatively unremarkable, no lesions or um, no pneumothoraces. So the lung markings go all the way to the top. And that's it, ABC 2S. Obviously, I would spend a lot more time on it, but, <laughs> but that is a good way to tell quickly whether or not you've got a pathology. Right, so we can move on to our cases. I have 11 cases, and depending on how interactive you guys are, it may or may not take um, more than sort of 15, 20 minutes. Um, and we should get started. Right, so if you type in the chat box what you think these are, um, if we've got, when we've got enough answers, I will reveal the answer. Now, don't be afraid to put the uh, to put a wrong answer in because it's as important to know why something isn't a fracture um, as yeah as it is to know what the correct diagnosis is. If you know what I mean. It sounds like most people have um, gotten it right. And this is a AC joint dislocation or disruption, so to speak. So you can see here very nicely, you've got, you don't have a fracture, but your um, AC joint is no longer aligned, shall we say. The glenohumeral joint is fine because here you can see that nice little Venn diagram type impression. Um, and the uh, appearance of your humeral head still has that walking stick type appearance. Great, we can move on to our next one. What is this? Most of these films have one abnormality. If they have more than one, I will tell you, and then you know you guys are aware, and know where, know to stop looking.
So most people have said anterior dislocation, and that is correct. So here you can see the humeral head is underneath the coracoid process, and this is a Y view. Your Y is here and your humeral head is here underneath the coracoid. So this is an anterior dislocation. Um, yeah, there we go. Next. So again, there's only one abnormality in this one. So um, someone's mentioned posterior dislocation, and that's um, I I wonder if that if it's the light bulb sign light bulb <laughs> sign that makes you think that. But if you look here, it's still got that nice overlap between the two. So this is still an a, a, an in joint shoulder basically, but. That's what I mean, as in if you internally rotate the shoulder, it looks like a light bulb, but it doesn't always mean that it's posteriorly dislocated. Yeah, OK, so people have seen it now. It's a fractured scapula. Look at that. This here. It's a comminuted fracture of your scapula. Look how badly it's fractured. But if you don't look at it, it's not it doesn't come sort of straight at you. So. Why is it important? Now another question for you guys. Why is it important to identify a fractured scapula? And how is it different from any other sort of fractured bone? Let me go. Someone's uh, said the right answer, which is the mechanism of injury. Exactly is um, well, it, it tells you that there's a very large or strong mechanism of injury. Because if you think about it, the scapula is a very flat bone, and usually when we injure our long bones, you get force that comes up and travels. But to fracture your scapula, it's very unlikely you're going to hit one of the edges, isn't it? It's a force that's come this way, and to, to shatter it. You not only have to pass through all this back muscle, your traps and your lats and everything else that's there, but it's also got to be a large enough sort of area of force to shatter it. So that implies that there are going to be other injuries, potential internal injuries as well. So if you see a fractured scapula in any case, however subtle, you need to consider more um, either cross-sectional imaging or more thorough imaging of the rest of the region. Well done. Oh, uh, someone's mentioned a rib fracture. So are you looking at this here? I don't know, I can't count. Two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so that unfortunately is just lung marking, but a good shout on looking at the ribs and making sure you're not missing out a rib fracture as well. Next, you guys are doing very well. You've been listening. Okay, what's this? <laughs> Grand, you guys have picked it up. So this is the posterior dislocation. See again, you've got nicely here, you've got the light bulb sign, but most importantly, there's no overlap between the humeral head and the, gleno, uh, the glenoid. And then in your Y view, um, you can see the humeral head is now not in the middle of the Y, and it's underneath the acromion. 
Um, you'll notice that you often get Y views with true shoulder dislocations because to get an axial view, you need to abduct the shoulder. So if you suspect a shoulder dislocation and it comes back with an axial view, you don't need, you know it's not dislocated because they can't abduct the arm if it's truly dislocated. Right, pro tip there. Okay, well done. Next. Um, what is wrong with this one? Again, there's only one abnormality on this film. Yep. Yep, exactly. I think most people have picked up that you've got something wrong with your humerus. And very aptly so this here, this is your lucent line. And this, like I said, you can often see the greater, greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity is much smaller and it often overlaps with the rest of the bone. So this is a minimally displaced or non-displaced greater tuberosity fracture. Well done. Often happens in older people when they fall on their shoulder, that's the first bit that they fracture, along with the clavicle as well. Next. So there's two abnormalities um, in this. They're all within the same region, but um, try and see if you can pick it up. I will accept this looks weird as an answer as well, because that's your gut feeling and gut feelings are very important when you're looking at x-rays. Oh, okay, we've got quite a few answers and they're all slightly different, which is very exciting. They're all not wrong, by the way. They're all correct, essentially. Great, so, okay. So this is a humeral head fracture or humeral neck fracture more like. So here, you can see the humeral head over here and then it kind of stops here and all of a sudden you've got the neck. So you know that it's been fractured and impacted, almost angulated. So this is a fracture and um, some of you have picked up that this space is much wider and it looks like it's dislocated, which I will give you that because we can't tell if it's dislocated or just sublux. But coming back to this space on this view, this is a modified axial view. What do you think this is? What is this? You can see the humeral neck fracture a bit better here now. Someone's mentioned fluid level. Yes, it is a fluid level. Fluid what level? <laughs> is it, it's, it's less dense. It's not quite as dense as this, uh, sorry. It's not quite as loosened as this outside, but what, what else could this be? It essentially is a hematoma, but what is this? This lighter bit up here. Does anyone know like a specific name we give to these kind of joint effusions. So someone's mentioned hemarthrosis, very close to something in front of it, something in front of hemarthrosis, lipohemarthrosis, there we go, well done. <laughs> so lipohemarthrosis stands for fat 
and blood. So this joint effusion, this dense fluid here is blood. And remember, you've got marrow in your bones, right? So if you've got a big joint um, fracture, that marrow, that fatty marrow can then come out of the joint and go into the joint space. So when you see a flat line in a joint effusion, it's a lipohemarthrosis. It's a fracture until proven otherwise. But I mean, you can see the fracture here, but um, in more subtle things like knee, uh, sort of tibial plateau fractures, sometimes you can only see a lipohemarthrosis. So it's important to uh, remember it. Well done. There we go. Fracture of the humeral neck with subacromial lipohemarthrosis. And the case I got this from said it was pseudo subluxation, so not a true dislocation. But in reality, you can't really tell unless you've got the patient to move their arm, which they probably can't, or you've got another better view. So well done for those of you who, th who said it was an anterior dislocation as well. Next. So this one has one abnormality. Um, and I will say it's in your view area. So someone's mentioned AC joint disruption. It looks like it, doesn't it? But if you draw a line from the underside of the clavicle to the underside of the acromion, it's still relatively intact. And that's why I mean, so most, most people are different. And as long as it's relatively intact, it's acceptable. And it doesn't look too dislocated like the first case that we saw. So that is um, acceptable, but good thinking. It does look a bit odd, I agree. Fab, you guys are really eagle-eyed and you've been listening. So this is a pneumothorax. So I'm just gonna illustrate the line here. So this is a pneumothorax after a sort of shoulder injury. There is no rib fracture to be seen here, but can I convince you that above this line, you can't see any lung markings. And here you can see the same as well. So this is all your fuzzy, fuzzy lung markings and there's not really that same linear quality there. Um, and then someone mentioned sternoclavicular joint dislocation. Now, uh, we can't actually tell on this x-ray. Good to think about it. We can't tell because of the direction that the clavicle comes in. It kind of comes towards you, towards, or towards the screen. Um, and then your sternum is sort of like this, basically. If you want to see the sternoclavicular joint, you need to do an a cl clavicle view, which often means that we angle the beam upwards and make sure we get the whole of the clavicle and then its um, attachments as well. But it's good to think about it. You guys are doing the right thing. Right. So this is a normal shoulder, but the apical pneumothorax. Well done. Uh, we're coming towards the end now. This is where it gets a little bit more interesting. And there are two, I will say there are two abnormalities. Give it a go.
Yes, yeah, so some a, a lot of you guys have um, noticed the first abnormality, which is your distal clavicular fracture. Here you go. It looks a bit odd because it's not that classic lucent line, but if you think about it, it's just like the fracture has occurred in the same plane as your X-ray. So this is what you're seeing, and you can see this lucent see through it like that. Well done. I agree. This part of the glenoid looks a bit odd, but it's um, it's basically just degenerative change. Good on um, whoever who picked it up, though. That's great. And with regards to open, whether or not it's an open or closed fracture, unless there's surgical emphysema and a, and, a, and, a, and a soft tissue defect, it's very difficult for us to tell. Obviously, that's where clinical colleagues are very important. You can see whether or not there's a wound associated with the injury. And it looks like some people have seen um, the second injury, but I will hold off a little bit just to give you guys um, uh, a bit more time. And again, it's in your review area, like I mentioned. So this this abnormality is a bit more subtle, and it's in, in our in our review areas. I think some people have started starting to see the rib fractures now. So it's in this region here. And if I point it out to you, so here you've got your first rib. And then when you trace your second rib, you've got a little step there. So you've got your second rib fracture. Then you go on third rib. And then this is even more subtle, but you've got a fourth rib fracture as well here. So this. This is the fourth rib fracture. It's very subtle. On, on your computers and workstations, obviously you can zoom in and window, it'd be a lot easier. But here on this Y view, you can also see your second rib fracture, a little bit more displaced than this. And then the fourth rib fracture as well here. This is not a buckle fracture. This is a fully grown adult, obviously, but it just looks that way because it's of the projection and the weight's only just minimally displaced. Well done. You saw it though. So you've got a distal clavicle fracture with second and fourth rib fractures. Review areas, very important. Oftentimes on, um, we find that um, uh, rib fractures are missed. So you're focused on the uh, pneumothorax, no, not pneumothorax, the pneumonia that you often um, forget to have a look at the ribs. So I am, uh, I'm proud of you guys. Well done. Just in the interest of time, I will point out some of these to you. So this is a left upper lobe lesion. So the this is just the appearance of a degenerative shoulder. And here you have a left upper lobe lesion here. Of course, you can't really compare it with previous, but it, you've, the first thing you should do is um, note it. And if it's not there, then, you know, it's a new finding and needs for the investigation. Um, this case also has a subtle undisplaced fracture of the acromion, but to be honest, I wouldn't expect you to see it on your screens. I don't. I expect you to maybe pick it up on a more high definition screen. And this one is a classic appearance of the heel sax lesion. So here you can see in the superior portion of the humeral head, you've got a little divot, and this is what that looks like. This almost looks like someone's taken a bite of a, out of an apple. It's definitely abnormal. You should have a nice rounded humeral head like that. And this last one, I will let you guys give a go. So this is the last one, and it's it's more subtle um, than before, but I think it'd be a nice case to end on. Let's see what you think.
Yay! It looks like most people have seen it. Well done. You guys are scapular experts now. So this is a scapular fracture. Um, here you can see the lucent line going through the glenoid. So it's likely that there's been impact this way to cause the fracture to propagate the other way. Um, and you can kind of see it propagating throughout the uh, rest of the scapula. And on your Y view, very helpfully, you can see that there's a disruption of the nice smooth blade of the scapula. Now, again, AC joints, they're tricky, aren't they? But if we draw a line on, from the bottom of the acromion, which is here, to the bottom of the clavicle, it's nice and smooth, so it's not disrupted. Yep, anything else? Posterior. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with what I said. It looks like it could be a posterior dislocation, um, but that's only because the glenoid is not sort of, is a little bit on fast, so you can't see it this way. But just trust me that this is in joint. <laughs> your humeral head is on the glenoid, so it's not a posterior dislocation. And here you can tell actually, here's your Y view, your humeral head is here. So it's, it's intersecting the Y. And if anything, it's heading more towards the uh, coracoid, probably because it's been rotated internally like that. Well done. So that is all of our shoulder cases. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, it is almost nine o'clock <laughs> and I still have the uh, elbow and shoulder, uh, sorry, forearm to do. Um, so I was wondering if you guys wanted a break really quickly to have a cup of tea or if you wanted me to just quickly run through it so we could hopefully finish in half an hour, 40 minutes. Someone say keep going. <laughs> in any case, I'm just going to run through the anatomy. So feel free to put me on speaker and then grab yourself a cup of tea, okay? I'm gonna move on to elbow and forearm. So we are gonna start with the elbow and then kind of continue down towards the forearm. And it's the same format. We go through anatomy, we use the assessment structure, and then we'll go through the quiz again. With an elbow uh, x-ray, you'll get two views, a lateral view and an AP view. And uh, in an adult elbow, this is your anatomy. Well, it doesn't change in a pediatric elbow, to be honest, you just can't see as many bones. Um, you've got your uh, ulna here, your radius, and important articular surfaces are your radial head, your coronoid process, and then your olecranon process as well. Then on your humeral side, you've got your trochlea that uh, articulates with the ulna. You've got your capitellum or capitulum that uh, articulates with the radius. Then you've got humeral condyles, which are these bits sort of underneath the trochlea and underneath the capitulum. And you've got the epicondyles, so the teeny tiny ones on either side. On a lateral view, you can see a lot of the same things. So you can see your radial head here. This little round ball <laughs> that you often see um, that's kind of coming off this little teardrop shape is actually your capitulum because you can see it articulates with your radial head. Just behind it is this slightly larger bulge. So this over here, that's your... Um, Oh no, I've got it wrong, sorry. This is your capitulum because it's articulating with your radial head, sorry. And this round ball is your trochlea because it's a ball and then your uh, coron, your, sorry, your ulna um, articulates with it like that. You've got your um, cor coronoid fossa, you've got your olecranon fossa behind. And then obviously you've got all these other bits, radial neck, uh, olecranon, coronoid process, etc. Now, the important thing on a lateral view, which I hope you guys will learn how to look at to, after this, is um, fat pads. So you can see your anterior and a posterior fat pad. Well, you've got two fat pads and you can commonly see your anterior. Posterior often sits within the olecranon fossa. So um, on a normal elbow, you don't see it. And these are relevant because it can denote a joint effusion. As you can see here, there's not a lot of fat, um, not like the knee where you've got fat pads that shows um, that can show you fluid. A lot of the elbow is just quite dense. So these fat pads and knowing what's normal and what's abnormal can be very useful in trying to uh, detect a fracture. Now, before we move on to trying to do the assessment, I want to introduce the pediatric elbow to you guys. So if you already know this, great, it'll just be revision. But if you don't, this is what a pediatric elbow looks like. 
Um, and like we said before, um, pediatric joints have a lot of cartilage and they're very little bones depending on when you image them. Um, there is a very useful mnemonic called CRYTOL, which tells you the chronology of ossification of the different bits of the elbow. So C stands for the cap cap um, capitellum, which is this, this has been labeled wrong, sorry. The capitellum with the radium, radius um, ossifies first, then you've got your radial head, then your internal epicondyle, so medial epicondyle, um, then the trochlea, which is here that articulates with your ulna, then the olecranon process, and then finally, last, your lateral epicondyle. Now, the reason why it's useful to identify these ossification centers and the chronology of ossification is, first of all, to not be surprised when you look at pediatric elbow and there's no bones in the joint. But second of all, um, if there is an avulsion of any one of these uh, epiphyses, knowing the uh, chronology in which it ossifies can be very useful. For example, if there appears to be a lateral epicondyle before the internal epicondyle has um, ossified, then you know that that's probably not the lateral epicondyle, it's probably a fleck of bone from somewhere else, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Right, so we will be going through some pediatric um, cases at the end, so hopefully that will give you a chance to practice the CRYTOL criteria. This is another illustration of um, the appearances of the pediatric elbow as they grow. So first you get your capitulum, then the radial head, then you know uh, internal epicondyle, trochlear olecranon often appear at the same time or at the same stages. And then finally, as you hit sort of 10, 11, 12 years old, you tend to have all the epiphyses and apophyses. Now we can start assessing our elbows. So I like to start with the lateral because like I said, you can tell um, if there are fractures based on whether or not there's a joint effusion, but also it's very useful with alignment. So again, in the elbow, we've got, we've got one main joint, but we've got three bones, don't we? So we need to check that all of these are aligned. And there are two very useful lines in the elbow called the radio capitella line, which is uh, drawn from the radial neck all the way back. It needs to intersect the capitulum right in the middle. And then you've also got your anterior humeral line. So if you draw a line from the anterior uh, border of the humerus all the way down, it needs to intersect at least the um, a third of the capitulum. So you it can be within the middle third of the capitulum. And this is useful because radio capitella line tells you whether or not the radius is in joint or if it's dislocated. And anterior humeral line will basically tell you if there has been a fracture of your supracondylar process, uh, supracondylar region here. Then once you're happy with your alignment, you can move on to bones. Once again, you've got three bones, so just trace them really well and make sure you can see um, a nice thin cortex. One of the things I do want to draw your attention to is this little cup here. So this articular surface of the radial head is almost like a little saucer. And sometimes um, you can you can only see a little lucency or a little step in this cup and you can't see any sort of cortical irregularities on the side. So if you just pay attention to this region here, you can pick up some more subtle um, fractures. So here again, that region. Okay, and then once you're happy with A and B, you can move on to C. So C refers to joints. So we're looking mainly in this in in this case for joint effusion. So like I mentioned, fat pads play a huge role in the elbow X-rays, and this is why elbow X-rays um, are one of my favorite. So anterior fat pad is quite normal. So if I can convince you, all this dense dense tissue is muscle, ligaments, skin, fat, so subcutaneous fat, sorry. And just in front here of the humerus is your anterior fat pad. Now, if you can see it, it can be normal because it should kind of gradually flow from the top of your, uh, sorry, distal humerus all the way down, sort of disappearing into the joint. It shouldn't be obvious at all. So there, there's an illustration. It almost looks like um, a sail, but like a 
closed down sail, so it's not sort of open and in the wind. Um, but when it's raised, that's when it has a more um, sort of right angle triangle type appearance. So this is more sort of closed triangle. Um, and I will show you examples of that. Now, I've talked a lot about the anterior fat pad. So the posterior fat pad, like I said, lives in the olecranon fossa. So you should really never see it. There's so much bone overlying it. Um, it's not really visible when it's normal. When it's abnormal, a lot of the um, fluid from the joint effusion can then travel into the olecranon fossa and push that out. So if you ever see, so this looks like there's a lucency here, but this is just what we call a MAC effect, where when you've got something really bright next to something less bright, you, your brain makes you think there's a darker line in between. But if there is like a triangular or a, a bulkier, darker line behind your humerus, then that is a posterior fat pad and it's always pathological. That always means there is a fracture. Okay, so I'll give you examples. These are examples of joint effusions. So before I highlight them, this here, this is your raised anterior fat pad. And this, very different from that MAC line we saw, this is more bulgy, it's more uh, lucent. This is a posterior fat pad. Same here, anterior fat pad, it's almost like pushed up that way. If you imagine your triangles this way, it's been pushed up like that. It's more sort of right angle-y. And this is your posterior fat pad here. And there it is highlighted for you. So if you're, like I said before, this is a raised anterior fat pad. And this is a posterior fat pad. There we go. If you see this, there's almost always a fracture. And here you can see the fracture in the radial neck. And then I believe this one is in the radial head. And there we go. Now, the interesting thing, so the reason why I showed you adult and children's elbows is, first of all, um, loads of children's, loads of children fall on their elbows. So it's good to know how to look at them when you're working in ED. Um, but also there is um, a difference between the most common fractures in children's and adults. So in an adult, the most common cause for an elbow effusion post-traumatic is a radial head fracture radial neck or radial head fracture. So if you can't see any fractures, but there is a joint effusion and you can see anterior fat pads or posterior fat pads, it's most likely going to be a radial head fracture. In children, however, um, it tends to be a supracondylar fracture. So a fracture up here or a lateral condyle fracture. So um, the lateral condyle would be where the um, capit, like just before the capitulum ossifies um, and that bit of bone can get fractured. I'll show you an example later. Um, right, so that's how we assess joint effusions um, in an elbow. And then once we're happy, say we can't see anything or we're happy with what we're seeing, we need to then move on to our 2S. So you've got soft tissue and a special review area. So soft tissue is really simple. You've got so much soft tissue, make sure you look at it. And basically, I want to remind you that there are loads and loads of muscles that that um, insert into the elbow. So if you have any sort of uh, forced flexion, forced uh, type injury, then muscle can pull bones, uh, bits of bone off like here. So you can be fooled to think that this is an apophysis uh, or an, you know, an epiphysis, but this is a fully grown adult. They've fused all their physes. And in the context of um, direct trauma or fall into the elbow while it's been flexed, then this is an, this is an avulsion fracture until proven otherwise. Okay. Now, the special review area, you can see I said polo ring concept. So that refers to the polo ring below the elbow. And I want to use this to segue into um, the forearm, basically. So this is this is our polo ring. OK, assessing your forearm is much, much simpler than elbows and joints. Um, oftentimes, this is when when you get you ask for a forearm X-ray, this is what you get. You get a bit of the elbow, you get a bit of the wrist in it. Um, but your main concern is looking at the ulna and the radius. Uh, I'm not going to patronize you if there is a fracture there through the 
the uh, ulna or the radius, you will see it and I don't need to tell you how to look for it. What I do want to um, tell you about is uh, things that are slightly less common but have bigger consequences. So we still use ABC2S for the forearm. A is, uh, refers to alignment of your joints. Like I said, you can see your joints above and below the forearm. So just look at them, make sure they're not grossly dislocated. B, again, cortex, you can trace it. You're all experts by now. Um, and C, well, there's, because there's no true joint in the forearm, I kind of skipped this bit, um, but I suppose you could consider the distances between your uh, distal radial ulnar joint and your proximal radial ulnar joint because you've got syndesmoses there. So you can have a look at those as well, make sure they're not uh, largely distracted. But um, we can move very quickly on to um, 2S uh, in the forearm, basically. So soft tissue, same concepts, make sure there's no irregularity to, show, uh, to denote laceration, no surgical emphysema, no foreign body. Um, and then once you're happy with that, you, your special review area is this polo ring. So I'm sure you've heard it to death. A polo ring doesn't just break in one spot. If you've got sufficient energy to uh, break one side, it often causes another injury on the other side as well. So this is um, where I introduce you to the Montegia and Galeazzi fracture dislocation syndromes. Often um, it's relatively high impact injuries, but it is important to note because sometimes your fractures are um, higher up or your dislocations are higher up and you've not if you're not aware then you won't think to image the rest of the forearm to catch the other bit of the injury so to speak okay um, again I hate eponymous names but there is a way to remember this so um, the way to remember which is which is by this mnemonic called mugger like someone who steals stuff from you um, so MU stands for Montegia and the U is the, uh, it describes which bone is fractured. So it's really silly, but this is how I remember it. Uh, a mugger comes, injures you, so um, it injures you and fractures something, so that's the ulna. And then it they take away the wallet, so your wallet's small. And so the dislocation of the opposite um, bone is at the smaller footprint. So you get a fracture of your ulna, and a dislocation of the radial head, because if you compare the radial, distal radial footprint to the radial head, the radial head is smaller. So that's how I remember it. it might be a bit silly, but. So a Montegia fracture dislocation, you get a fracture of your ulna with a radial head dislocation. So you can see here, if you've just gotten your elbow, you might miss this uh, ulna fracture. Um, so it's important to be aware of it and make sure you get the rest of the forearm. Moving on, our Galeazzi is the exact opposite. G for Galeazzi, R for radial fracture, and the dislocation is of the ulna where it's smaller, so the distal ulna here, compared to you know the big olecranon process on the other end. So this is your, is your Galeazzi fracture. And that's it, that's your elbow and forearm. Quickly uh, recap how I look at the elbow and then we can move on, um, sorry, elbow and forearm, and then we can move on to our cases. Hope you guys are still with me. So A, alignment. We want to check our anterior humeral line, our radio capitella line. Um, uh, and then B for bones. So make sure we're checking every surface we can see, including this radial uh, head surface. Make sure we're looking up in the supracondylar region as well. Then we can look at C, which is joints. So we're looking at this an this anterior region, making sure there's no sort of big sail like that. Posterior region, making sure there's no big um, sort of bulgy, lucent region. That would be our posterior fat pad. So happy, no joint effusions. And then 2S, so soft tissues. I can't see any, looking at our soft tissues and tendon insertions, I can't see any avulsions. I can't see foreign bodies, um, no surgical emphysema. And then special review areas would be our polo ring. So there's no fracture here and nothing to make me suspicious that there's a distal injury. Quickly, same thing again with the elbow, uh, sorry, the forearm. Um, you're looking for alignment. This looks well aligned, that looks well aligned. Bones, making sure you 
trace the shaft well, especially in children, because this is where you can get sort of distal uh, buckle fractures or green stick fractures or more subtle type of um, injuries. Um, see, I'm supposed to look at your uh, radial ulnar joints and then 2S, so soft tissue and the special review area. Make sure this polar ring is nice and intact. There you go. So we've got 12 <laughs> forearm uh, and elbow cases. Um, and we'll see how we get on. And then we may or may not uh, just quickly go through the last few if uh, we run out of time. Fab. OK. So let's give this a go. Again, there's one abnormality here. Yeah, it looks like a couple of people have spotted it. It is uh, an olecranon fracture. So this is the main thing here. You've got a lucent line through your olecranon. Yep, vertical fracture, fantastic. And it's also slightly comminuted, if I can convince you here. There's one piece here and one piece here. Well done. And that is a little bit of soft tissue swelling around the elbow. If you think about your own elbow, it's quite thin over here, isn't it? So any sort of swelling in this region should point towards true soft tissue swelling, unless it's a child and they've got chubby arms. But this we know is an at least a skeletally mature uh, person. Um, the raised anterior fat pad is a bit more subtle, uh, and I will put my hand up and say that. So that's this here. So this slight lucency there, but I don't blame you if you didn't see it. Well done on picking up the fracture. There we go. Fracture and this, this here, this is your fat pad. Just made it a little bit more contrasty. Next. Fab, looks like you guys are right on it. So we've got a radial head fracture. Well done. So this is it here, lucent line through your radial head. Can't really see it on your lateral, but what you can see on the lateral is this beautiful anterior fat pad. So it's, that's it there. There's no posterior fat pad, which is quite normal because it's a, it's a, it's a non-displaced fracture. So maybe the effusion isn't that great, but there we go. That shouldn't be there so your fat pad should just seamlessly flow into the joint so to speak well done next also um i like what you guys are doing telling me whether or not there's a fat pad and then whether where the fracture is <clears throat> that's great that's exactly how you should be thinking <laughs>
I'm very proud. You guys are all picking up the fat pads. That's great. So you're right. There's an anterior and posterior fat pad. Here it is now. Nice right angle lucency here. And then this little bulgy bit at the back, lucent posterior fat pad. So you know there's a joint effusion in the context of trauma. Where's our fracture? That's the question. So um, I think some people mentioned whether or not there's dislocations. Um, that's my fault. This is not a true AP view. It's almost like an oblique view. So that's where things can look a bit odd. So the, the olecranon itself is fine. There appears to be, a, a it looks like there's a lucent line, but there really isn't. It's just sort of the, the um, irregularity of the, the bone and the way the uh, x-ray is projected. Um, and I think you're looking at the right region here. So this is where the fracture is. This is where the fracture is. Can anyone? It's very subtle, though. It's not the radial head. It's it's the radius. It's proximal radius, absolutely. But it's um, it's something else. There we go. Neck. Yes, it's the radial neck. It's here. So the the articular surface and the head itself is fine because you can get fractures through it like we saw before, but this is a radial neck fracture. Now, contextually, it doesn't change that much, but it just means that it's not through an articular surface and that has consequences to the patient. It might not have consequences to the actual management. That's all right. Okay, so well done. So this one isn't dislocated because your anterior humeral line is nice and straight. It goes through your capitellum, which is this bigger bit, not the small one. The small one is your trochlea. Uh, and then your radial head is in joint as well because it's slightly angulated, like I said, but it articulates well and the line is, it passes through the capitellum. There we go. Next, again, apologies for this oblique view of the um, of the radius of the elbow, sorry. Yeah, okay. Looks like most most people have gotten it. So it's a raised anterior fat pad. Look at you picking out those fat pads. That's great. So this is your fat pad here. And in this film, I will just say now there's no obvious fracture. So there's no distinct fracture. But in a patient that looks like this, what do we think the most likely fracture is? Oh yeah, the lateral epicondyle. This is the lateral epicondyle here. Um, yeah, it, it just, it looks odd because of the, the way it's been rotated. What you're seeing here is just the, it's where the, uh, it's the common extensor tendons. Yes, they attach. So that's that little divot where the, the tendons attach. But usually you're right, you don't see this appearance or medial here. Again, it's just the way it's been rotated. It looks more bulgy, but it in reality isn't. This was more just to um, illustrate the that they're all in joint and they're nice and smooth. There we go. Yes, sorry. The um, yes, in a patient that's skeletally mature, um, the most common fracture is a radial head or a radial neck fracture, proximal radius. Well done. So if you see this, treat the patient as a fracture, immobilize them, refer them to a virtual fracture clinic because 
something's going on. All right, again, that's just to illustrate the um, anterior fat pad. Aha, okay, what is this? Yes. Okay. So this is clearly a fracture and a dislocation. And then the trick is, in reality, you could just Google this, but let's pretend we can't Google. Um, it's to figure out what eponymous name it's called. So we can all see that there's a nice displaced mid ulna fracture with a dislocation here, right? The radial head is definitely not in joint with the capitellum anymore. Um, so this is, you've got a ulna fracture. So it's a U. And then MUGR is M-U-G-R. So it's a Montegia fracture with a proximal radial dislocation, or the smaller footprint of the two. Yeah. And what about this? <laughs> Well done. Yes, exactly. So it's a Galeazzi fracture or very aptly put a radial shaft fracture with a distal on the dislocation. You can also do that, um, but it's known as a Galeazzi fracture. So your fracture is of the radius. Uh, so R, so mugger G R. And then the ulna is dislocated and it's dislocated where it's smaller. So it's the distal um, ulna over here. Right. So we're moving on to some pediatric elbows now. Um, the concept of assessment is still exactly the same. Um, so I just want you guys to give this a go and see whether or not you can pick up the abnormalities. Just trying to demystify the pediatric elbow. You have done, you have done very well so far. And while we're at it, if anyone wants to hazard a guess as to how old this patient is, give it a go. <laughs> oh, yeah, someone's asked me how old the child is. Um, so the ossification centers are normal. So I want to say that they are. Five to six years old. Approximately. <laughs> so I've got some good answers already. And if I don't know if it'll help if I just tell you that this is your capitulum because in Crytol C comes first. So C is ossified. Um, it's the first to ossify. So that's your capitulum there. That's your radial head epiphysis. This is your internal epicondyle.
Okay. So uh, we, someone has mentioned the correct answer, which is um, radial head dislocation. And here, if I draw the anterior humeral line, you can see, yes, it bisects the cap capitellum or capitulum. So there's no supracondylar fracture. In any case, there's not really a good going fat pad. Um, but if I draw the radio capitella line, it's not, it's nowhere near the capitellum. It's kind of intersecting the, the notch here. Um, and this view looks a bit odd, doesn't it? It looks like the radius is sort of closer to the humerus, and that's because it's sort of dislocated out. Um, so this is a radial head dislocation. So you've got a disrupted radio capitella line. Um, now the olecranon looks a bit odd, but it's probably because the ossification center hasn't come up yet. So it looks shortened. So I understand why you think it looks a bit irregular because C-R-I-T-O-L, it's one of the fifth ones, well, the fourth and fifth ones um, to ossify. And this patient has only got three. So it's still got a lot of growing to do before you see an uh, olecranon uh, epiphysis. Okay, what about this one? So tell me where the fracture is and how you, so what other features there are there? Nice. So it looks like everyone's seen it. It's this fracture here. And it's tricky when you're trying to figure out, oh, is this epicondyle, condyle? Um, so it's actually, so this is your condyles. You've got your capitulum, your trochlea hasn't ossified yet. This, like I said, behind is your condyle. And then these are your epicondyles, these little pointy bits. So it's above them. So this is a supracondylar fracture. And um, Exactly. Someone's mentioned that the anterior humeral line doesn't intersect properly. So if you draw a straight line down, like I said, it should intersect the middle third of the capitulum, capitulum or capitellum. And it kind of just skims the anterior, the anterior border of it. So that means it's probably because the, there's a fracture and your, the bottom bit of that humerus has moved backwards. And very rightly so, you all have seen this lovely anterior, uh, posterior fat pad, sorry, there we go. And if I can convince you here, look, straight line through the radius intersects the capitellum. So this radio capital line is intact. So it's a anterior fat pad. I can't see it that well today, I have to be honest. I saw it when I prepared this case, but definitely the one I want you to recognize is the posterior fat pad. Next. Okay. So it looks like we've got a couple of answers in and I'm very impressed. So the anterior fat pad is raised. Well done, there it is. So we've got our fracture going and um, it is this over here. So it 
looks like it'd been in the right position for the Olecranon apophysis, but this patient only has a Capitella epiphysis at the moment. So C-R-I-T-O-L, where's the other three? The radial head doesn't look terribly ossified, in which case the internal, um, if, if you can't see it very well, you've still got I, so internal epicondyle, can't see it there. T, there's definitely no ossification of the trochlea. Suddenly we've got an electron on that is odd. So that points towards it being a probable avulsion fracture as opposed to an apophysis. Even though it looks well-rounded, it looks well-corticated, in an adult, you'd say, mm, that's an ossicle. It's not a fracture. But because of Kreitol, we can be, be a bit more confident and because of the fat pad as well. And someone mentioned whether or not there was a uh, sort of fracture around this region. There is also a radial neck fracture. So it's not obvious in the lateral view, but when you look on this AP view here, you can see a line of the of the neck going up and the head. It's not continuous, probably because it's been compressed down that way. Um, in this case, I don't think there's a true posterior fat pad. What you're probably seeing is that MAC line, so M-A-C-H, look it up. It's an, an optical illusion where when you see something really bright next to something less bright, you perceive a dark line um, between the two. And that's it's not there, it's just your brain. <laughs> so once you understand that, then um, uh, you can try and think that a posterior fat pad has to be more obvious. And if, if and if this lucent line goes all the way up, it can't be a fat pad. It's probably an optical illusion. Fat pad should just be sort of in and around the electron on fossa. Next. You guys are doing very well. Pediatric elbows are, are difficult, but um, if you're picking up the right tools. Yeah, it looks like most people have seen what I intended for them to see. This one is easier because you've seen it before already. It's in a slightly different form. This is a um, radial neck fracture here, very nicely illustrated. The whole radius is kind of angulated downwards. It also probably is slightly dislocated because um, that articular surface is no longer congruent. Um, and you also have a lovely little anterior fat pad here. So raised anterior fat pad with a radial neck fracture. And look on this lateral view. So this is a modified AP view, in fact. Um, the, on this lateral view, all you get is this slight bulging. That isn't normal. Your cortex, like I said before, nice and smooth as it travels across. So this is not normal to have a, light, a bump, especially in a kid. Any bump, any slight widening, you need to be, you need to be thinking about traumatic fracture. But well done. 
one of our last uh i think so i actually wanted to uh take you guys through this one so this is a more subtle fracture um and actually this fat pad here i don't think it looks particularly raised if you think back to all your other fat pads they will probably raise it's more um it was more sail like so to speak this looks like it flows quite nicely into the joint and if anyone can remember i mentioned that there were two common fractures in children one is supracondylar fracture the other one is a lateral condyle fracture now um and they only happen when your uh i suppose your physis haven't fused yet so in this child you can see they've got a, capitul a capitulum. There's a very faint, tiny bit of radial head, and then you've got your internal epicondyle. So they may be about four, six years old. And they have a fracture and it's here. So it's this very, very faint line at the lateral condyle. Epicondyles are here, not, not um, ossified yet. This is a non-displaced lateral condyle fracture. And um i realized when i was doing sort of training that we don't place enough emphasis on this and it's as common as a supracondylar fracture uh, in children um so there you go that's a little tip lateral condyle fractures uh, and supracondylar fractures uh, in a child's elbow so this is raising a tear fat pad i it, i don't think it's that raised actually okay um let's see yeah, there we go. Just highlighting that lateral condyle fracture. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and this last one. So this last one, I will tell you straight away, has to do with our lovely cry toll. And try and see if you can figure out what's going on here. I think it's one of our last cases as well. So well done, everyone. Just give you a bit more time to work through that cry toll. We've got a few answers, so that's good. You can always work through them. Yeah. Okay. Right. So let's work through cryotol then. C. 
capitellum. So that's this here, R, radial head. And that's, you can see that capitellum, radial head, so CR. I, internal epicondyle, so internal is medial. So it's on this side. It's not there, fine. Um, T, trochlea. So trochlea should be next to the capitellum. And I suppose this is it. It's a bit small, but that's normal because it's one of the last few to ossify. Um, and then you've got L, lateral epicondyle. C-R-I-T-O-L. Olecranon, sorry. Olecranon here and then L. So it's odd that we don't have our C-R-I internal epicondyle. Um, so then we need to look and figure out where it is. So if I can convince you, this here, it's strange. It's, what is it? You don't have a coronoid ossification center. This is your trochlea. So the trochlea shouldn't be far away from it. Sorry, the, the epiphysis shouldn't be too far away from the lateral condyle. Um, you've got your O and uh, your L here. So O and L are here, which means the only explanation is that this must be an avulsed bit of the medial epicondyle or the internal epicondyle. So there is a very faint raised fat pad, which is seen better on um, uh, the sort of DICOM screens with windowing. And then this is actually an avulsed segment of the internal epicondyle. So if you think about it, your internal epicondyle is where all your flexor muscles are, and that's quite strong. So the common um, insertion of the flexor muscles. Um, so it's a common, it's one of the most common uh, ossification centers to be avulsed in an injury. And commonly it would avulse and then kind of lie somewhere in the joint. So for those of you who said internal epicondyle, medial epicondyle, well done, you're correct. Um, with regards to uh, whether or not it's a fracture, so it's probably, well, this is a fracture, but everything else, this is all normal physis. Um, and in this case, so someone mentioned olecranon fracture. So in the previous case where there was only C, R, and I, and a little bit, and a fleck there behind the olecranon, that was probably a fracture because um, your tro uh, the trochlea hadn't uh, ossified yet, or maybe the internal epicondyle hadn't ossified yet. So that didn't make, it didn't make sense for you to have an olecranon uh, apophysis or the old bit, I suppose. Um, and in the case of trauma, it's more likely to be an avulsion fracture. Whereas in this case where you can actually go C-R-I-T-O-L with, you know, bearing in mind that that was missing, then this is likely to be an ossification center as opposed to a, a true fracture. Yeah, that's the abnormality. So it needs it needs to sit here. The reason why it's bigger than the lateral one as well is because it ossifies uh, earlier. So it's got more time to form more bone compared to the lateral one. So that's why that one looks a bit smaller. And it's been avulsed by the muscle and it now lies in the joint. And that's it. You've survived um, going through the shoulder, the elbow and the forearm. Well done, everyone. Um, uh, a quick recap of uh, the ABC2S of the elbow and forearm is can be read here. In the meantime, if you guys have any questions at all or you have any feedback, I would uh, greatly appreciate that. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, the quizzes and a quick run through of how to look at the shoulder, elbow and the forearm. We have massively overrun. <laughs> I do apologize on my part, but I hope it was useful. Um, Let's see, there we go. Thank you for listening. I think um, Syra has very helpfully put a link in the chat box for the feedback. Um, and if you have any further questions, this is my personal email. I'm more than happy to answer. No, uh, no question is stupid, basically. But thank you very much for being patient and uh, for bearing with me. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau, that was fantastic. Um, I learned a lot. I, I stuck with it the whole time. I really enjoyed the cases. It was actually really fun to do. So thank you so much. I know I'm wrapped up here. It's freezing in my house. Um, so yeah, I've just popped some links in the chat. So the top link is to fill in our feedback form. So you will get your certificate of attendance once you fill in your feedback form um, to join our next event um, is the second link. So you click on that. Um, and that will um, be for um, 
the bear with me um, for the CTAP webinar, um, which will be on the 5th of January at 8 p.m. with Dr. Henry de Boer, um, and it will be about the basic structured approach and common cases and fit pitfalls of CT abdomen and pelvis interpretation. So the third link is to sign up to any of the other webinar series that Mind the Bleep offer. So any medicine, surgery, finance, pediatrics and ophthalmology, click the third link. Um, and if you have any questions, please do contact Dr. Lau. Um, I can't say enough that that was actually fantastic. I, I did really, really enjoy that. So thank you so much. Um, and brilliant. If uh, that's nothing else, then Merry Christmas and see you very, very soon. Bye now. Thank you.